So welcome everybody to the virtual seminar in economic theory. Today we are happy to have Federico Echenique from Caltech. Uh, thank you Federico for joining us. He's presenting a screening P hackers, dissemination of noise as paid. Uh, it's a joint work with Kevin He. And we have as guest panelists, Marco Taviani and Peter Sorensen. So thank you for, for joining us today. The format is a 60 minute presentation followed by 15 minutes of a Q and A session. And at the end, we, we, we have a virtual hangout in the Virtual Chair Academic Metaverse. We will provide you the link at the end of the seminar. During the talk, please post, uh, I mean, you can, uh, you can uh, during the talk, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions uh, directly to, to Federico. Um, let me remind you that the talk is recorded. Uh, our next speaker is after Easter, the 28th of April. And in that occasion, uh, we're gonna have Kevin He from UPenn who will present private, private information. So thank you, Federico, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Angel, and yeah, th th thanks is in, it, in particular. Can you fix the live stream? I don't know what's wrong with it. Oh, I, I don't even know what the link is. Well, Marin says you can find it by clicking that link. Clicking what link? Oh, wait, sorry. Angel, you're muted. Hey, Federico, I think you can start now. Sorry. It's all good? All right. Okay. So th thank you so much, Angel, and, and, and thank you, uh, especially uh, Peter and Marco, for um, for for joining us as guests. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, as, as Angel said, this is John work with Kevin Hay uh, from, from UPenn, and I guess you're having him next week. So it's, uh, yeah, so you get two helpings of Kevin, um, which is good. So it's a paper about p-hacking. So let me just um, try to uh, try to provide you with a, a, a basic idea of the type of p-hacking that we are concerned with. Um, and um, so here's, here's a cartoon. Uh, so in the cartoon, there's a scientist talking to a journalist and the scientist says, we found no link between purple jelly beans and acne. Then you know, the scientist reports no link between, uh, between brown jelly beans and acne, and then no link between pink jelly beans and acne. And all of these uh, you know, statements are, are made with a, with a p-value uh, of 0 0.005. So there's no link uh, when you uh, um, require this level of statistical significance. Uh, but then you know, the interview goes on, and then they, they, there's no link you know, between salmon, red, turquoise, magenta, yellow, and so on, until, you know, at one point, the scientist says that there is actually a, a link, a correlation between green jelly beans and acne at a significance level of P, uh, P0.05. And, you know, of course, the journalist uh, prints uh, that green jelly beans uh, are linked to acne and that this statement is made with a 95% confidence. Uh, so of course we all we all know that there's a problem with this uh, type of statement when um, when you use this level of statistical significance for what is effectively a multiple uh, hypothesis. Um, there's an older example in in economics. I don't know if uh, if you're old enough to remember uh, this literature on cross country growth regressions. Um, uh, so this uh, very provocative title by Xavier Sali Martin alluded to the fact that. Uh, that, that a lot of this literature was driven by this multiple hypothesis uh, comparison by uh, essentially by, by p-hacking, by running many different specifications. Um, there is a, a very dramatic and sad uh, uh, misuse of statistics in the forensic use of DNA evidence. I believe this is much better now, but when, uh, when, when DNA evidence became first important in the in the in in the use by you know the police, they would uh, search DNA databases for some uh, you know DNAs that they found in a in a, in a crime scene, um, and then they would go through very large databases of of, uh, of DNA evidence and find a suspect in this way. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, of uh, a, a man who was found guilty, actually convicted and put in jail. And, and, and he wasn't the, the only one, there, there were several examples like this. Um, and then 
you know, uh, the, the lawyers started to question, uh, you know, the DNA evidence. And after the court issued a subpoena to compel the lab to com uh, disclose its findings, they, it turns out that, they, that this, he, he wasn't the only person that they found that matched the data. There were 90 others in the, the same database, which also matched the DNA. And this is supposed to be sort of a, the, this quality of match was supposed to only be possible in one in one trillion uh, event. Um, and then, you know, this, um, I mean, I, I understand that this right, right now that this, um, um, people are aware about this, this problem in, in the NAF. Um, so anyway, so p-hacking is this kind of uh, much broader term which refers to researcher degrees. I, I think the original name of this phenomenon is called researcher degrees of free, freedom. Um, so uh, this was, um, you know, people started to become conscious of this, you know, maybe 10, 15 uh, years ago. Uh, and, um, and it has been documented in many different areas of, of science. It's, it's essentially everything you can do that affects the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, conclusions in, in an in empirical study. Uh, but in our paper, we are gonna take a much narrower view of what p-hacking is. And we will, you know, we will think about p-hacking as the, the phenomenon that happened in the cartoon with uh, the green jelly beans. So that you attempt multiple covariates or multiple econometric specifications, uh, and then you selectively report the most significant one. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, broadly speaking, the kind of p-hacking that we focus on in, in our paper. Uh, this, the phenomenon of p-hacking is found in various disciplines. Maybe the most famous um, examples arise in, in, in psychology and, uh, and people in psychology have discussed different ways of addressing this. Um, we think that the type of p-hacking that we focus on here is particularly severe these days uh, because of the wide availability of very large data sets that allow for the possibility of checking uh, and attempting ma many different econometric sp specification. Uh, at the same time as there are very powerful computers available uh, that allow you to try out, you know, um, sort of do specification, uh, specification searching. So this raises the question, and that's the question that we address in this paper, is how you, how you, how you can mitigate the harms of p-hack results on, on policy making, or if you want, on, on scientific conclusions, uh, in a world that implements policies based on p-values. So in a world that doesn't you know, try to modify the statistical um, uh, conventions that are used to evaluate uh, you know, conclusions drawn from, from the empirical analysis uh, on, of, of data. Now, in seemingly unrelated news, uh, the statistical agents such as the 2020 US Census uh, inject noise into the um, data bases that they release. Uh, and this is done with the, with the purpose of protecting the privacy of the survey or the census respondents. So the 2020 Census is being released with, uh, with noise. Uh, for privacy reasons, uh, and um, and you know some version of this has been going on for a very long time, including you know just suppressing uh, data tables that have too few uh, that that are based on answers from too few respondents to protect their privacy. You could think of that as a way of of noise. Um, but now more more recently, you know, based on the uh, ideas of differential privacy, um, the the statistical agencies will simply add noise to, uh, to, to data before they release it. Um, so even though this is being done with a different purpose, the point of our paper is that you may use the same um, ideas to, uh, to address the problem of p-hacking. And that's, that's what we, uh, I mean, first we will you know, we'll make the observation that this is possible, a very simple observation, um, and then we will and you know, of course, what's going to happen is that this will be you know, good for some people, but good for some purposes, bad for other purposes. And then we propose a model that allows us to evaluate the trade-offs uh, in adding noise to the data. <clears throat> okay. So the main idea in this project, there will be two kinds of researchers, the p-hacker 
uh, and the other we call them the mavens. Um, so the maven is going to basically be, it's going to be a, be a theorist. So I mean, we are theorists. We think of the theorists of the good guys. Um, so you know, the, the mavens would be theorists that are out to you know, they're out to test a particular hypothesis. The p hackers have no theory. They're just going to data mine and then uh, present something um, as a valid causal uh, mechanism, um, but, but which is in reality just a, a correlation that they found in, in the data. So what, what the dissemination noise, so this practice of adding noise to the data before you release it, is going to convert some covariates into baits that appear correlated, um, but that when you check them against the raw original data without noise, will, uh, will be shown not to be uh, correlated with, um, with a variable uh, of, of interest. So, so essentially, by adding noise, you can create spurious correlations that can be shown to be spurious. Uh, and that's what we, we mean by Bates. OK? At the same time, this will be bad for the mavens, for the legit legitimate researchers that have a specific hypothesis that they wish to test, that are not enga engaged in data mining. Uh, and then you know, we want to analyze this trade-off between the effect of noise on, um, on preventing hacking by, by creating these baits that catch the hackers. Uh, and then on, on the other hand, um, on what it does to the leg legitimate test of, of the data, okay? So basically, we're trying to uh, look at the problem that uh, some, uh, we, we call them a data steward or a principal, someone who has the data and releases it. So uh, what is the optimal amount of noise that they should add? And so the basic result is going to be that under, um, under our assumptions, that this level of noise will be strictly positive. So you will want to add some noise to the data for these, uh, for these reasons. And so the, the key intuition, let me just give away the basic idea in the paper, is that you know, a small amount of noise is going to hurt hackers more than the mavens. And the reason is really simple. The mavens only entertain, you know, by, by definition, because they are, they are out to test specific hypotheses, they entertain a small number of hypotheses. So if you, if you add a little bit of noise to the data, this is not going to, in, going to interfere very much with the chances of detecting the truth because they're focused on a small number of hypotheses. The, a small amount of noise is unlucky to mess up their, their conclusions. But the hackers, uh, you know, again, by definition, they're going to rationally try out a very large number of model specifications. Uh, and, and therefore, even a small amount of noise is going to, uh, you know, with, with high probability, create a, um, a spurious correlation in the, in the data that they're going to get, you know, uh, caught up in. Um, and, and so the hackers' data mining um, am amplifies the effect of even a small amount of noise, and they, it makes them more likely to fall for the bait and get screened out. Okay. I ask a question here, clarification. Yeah, yeah. So, so the objective of the data owner, who is also the principal here, is this the same as as the mavens? Do they are they trying to discover truth? Uh, not necessarily. Else? So, it in there, there is a, there is some uh, alignment in preferences, uh, but um, but but yeah. So the, the the owner of the data wants to get the truth. Um, the, the maven can also care about getting published, uh, but they need to care to some extent also about the, about the, 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 the truth. So, so that will be clear in, when, I, when I specify the model, but, but yes, they, they don't need to have identical uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. But the key idea is that the, uh, the, the principal will care about getting the, yeah, the, get, getting the truth. So this is the outline of the talk. Let me, let me you know, the, the, the basic model is very simple. Uh, I'll, I won't walk you through the, the, the proofs. The ideas behind the proofs are basically what I have, what I'm gonna say in words. Um, there is there's a dynamic model, which is um, maybe addresses 
um, one of the questions you, you're going to have, uh, and I expect to get to that. Um, then there are some extensions which I don't want to get into because I think that yeah, basically you will see the models are special, uh, but many of the assumptions in the model can be relaxed, and that's what we do in the extensions. But I think that's pretty boring, so I, I will not, you know, walk you through all the extensions. So I will, I will just stop. Um, yeah. Anyway. So before I give you the model, let me let me give you a motivating numerical example, um, which is perhaps you know um, somewhat realistic. Um, so here's so here's the numerical example. Um, so suppose there's one dependent variable and 20 covariates. Okay, so the 20 covariates, which are all IID uh, normally distributed, uh, you know, standard uh, uh, random variables. Okay, and they are independent in themselves. So the principal uh, goes, you know, so, so this is the data generating process no, for the for the for the covariates, and the principal goes out and collects 20 observations of this. Okay. So why is a dependent variable and then there are the 20 covariates? Now, a key aspect of this example, and this is um, this would be true in the theoretical model. This is one of the most important aspects of the, of the model that we that I, I want to highlight, is that this is a is a wide data set. What, what do I mean by wide? Well, in the sense that there are there's a large number of, so, so basically, if you think of this data as a spreadsheet, you know, wide means that this is a wide spreadsheet. It has many columns relative to how many rows there are. So, so because there are relatively many columns, I mean, here it's squared, 20 by 20, right? But, but because there are many columns, there are many possible models that, uh, if you think about the regression, many possible models that you could try out, okay? So, so there are 20 observations, but if you just focus on um, models with three regressors, then there are uh, 1140 linear models of this kind, okay? And of course, with more than three regressions, many more, of course. Um, so, so let's assume that, that the true model has three regressors. And in fact, so since we created this example, the true model is actually this one, okay? So Y is just the sum of the first three covariates. Okay, so we know this. Okay, Federico. Uh, so yes. I have a question. Yes. So, so uh, here the p hacker strategy, right, is is what is to find a nice regression or to find a p value that uh, makes his regression statistically significant. Both. The the p hacker is going to just try to find a model that passes statistical criteria. To find a model, right, and the p doesn't change. Yeah, we we you're gonna pick a p. Uh, you know, five percent. Right? Okay. Yeah, you, you pick a p, let's say five percent. So that's the statistical standard, um, and then you. Um, so that's that's the standard that the that the you know the policymaker will use or the editor of the journal will use um, to decide whether this is. Uh, so they don't decide. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, that, that that's another that's another important assumption we're going to make. You could. Think of the. I mean, you could think of a model where you try to come up with the right uh, statistical, um, you know, threshold to, to use in a world with p hacker. And of course, there are there are papers that, that do this. That that's another. That's a sort of a, and, and you know, I, I I'm going to argue it's a complementary approach to ours. Um, but uh, but we don't do that. We we think that, you know. Um, we live in a world um, where the statistical uh, norms are fixed and that they are, let's say, 5% p-value, uh, and that's basically what the p-hacker uh, is, is trying to, to achieve. Sorry. Okay. Okay. This is a world in which the p-hacker is so powerful, actually, that even if you, even if you do a 0 0.005 uh, p-value, uh, as some people propose, that the hacker will actually just be able to meet those things because the data set is wide enough that this will happen. So Federico, can the p hacker can also leave out some observations, or is it just about the choice of covariates? It's it's about the choice of covariates. So yeah, so so this is uh, so that that's yeah. I mean, what you're hinting at is that you know p hacking can mean different things, uh, and um, yeah, the, 
So I'll, I'll quickly mention the literature on p-hacking in, in economics. Uh, you know, and you know, Marco and Peter have contributed to this by looking at, at yeah different different notions of, of, of p-hacking. But we are narrowly focusing on p-hacking that is based on just trying out different uh, specifications. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so. All right, so that, so that's the example, right? So you, ha you have a dependent variable Y, which is in reality generated as the sum of the three uh, covariates, uh, but you have this data set, uh, which is, you know, is 20 by 20 uh, spreadsheet that you can, you can try out, okay? Now, so we use this language of policy making. You, if you want, you can think of this instead of the language of publishing papers in journals, uh, but, but the, if you adopt the language of policy making, you can think that the owner of the data, the data steward is the principal, the researcher is the agent, and then there's a policy maker who really doesn't make any decisions here. They just apply statistical criteria. Okay, so the policy maker is like the journal editor. They don't know which three covariates generate why. So, you know, they have a policy, which is, you know, what are the three covariates? You know, maybe they're implementing, you know, some, uh, some policy based on this uh, idea. Uh, so the agent is going to propose such a thing, or they're going to write a paper where they propose a causal mechanism, and the policymaker is going to say that if if this exceeds the statistical uh, threshold, then it is going to accept it. Uh, okay, it's going to adopt the policy, or it's going to publish the paper, um, and then uh, and that's it. That's the very simple game between the and the, the principal, meaning the data steward, the agent, who is the one who proposes a model, a causal mechanism, and then the policymaker who is just approving or, or rejecting the proposal based on whether it passes um, statistical uh, criteria. So the principle is, the, the only thing they can do in our model is they can decide how much noise to add to the data. Okay, so they're going to take the data and they're going to add some noise, which in our numerical example takes the form of uh, normal, uh, noise and the amount of noise is measured by the magnitude of the standard deviation. Okay, uh, and and that's all. So if they choose to uh, a standard deviation of zero, then they release the data without any noise. If they have a strictly positive standard deviation, they will inject some noise into the data. And they are trying to maximize the expected utility from the policy. Then the agent's behavior, okay, so the agent can be either a maven or a hacker. The maven knows that there are just two possibilities. So they have a specific hypothesis that they want to test. They know it's either one, two, three, which you know, we uh, know is a correct one, or this alternative policy, four, five, six, which we know is incorrect, but the maven doesn't know. The maven has, you know, they, they have uh, written, you know, they have, read the, they have read the literature, they have written this model, they prove the theorem, and then, you know, they, they narrow things down to these two uh, possibilities. They know it's either one, two, three, or four, five, six, okay? So they're just gonna run two regressions, and they're going to report the one that best fits the, bit, best fits, fits the data. The hacker, instead, has no idea about the correct policy. They're going to run all possible regressions with three covariates, all 1140 uh, regressions. And then they're going to report uh, the one that, that has the highest R square. And then the policymaker is going to naively use a 5% p value on the R square um, and, then, uh, and then publish a paper as long as it passes the statistical uh, criteria when you compare it uh, with, the, with the data without noise. Okay, so there are. So are, the data is validated against, the proposal is validated against the data without noise. So here's the picture of the payoff when you face a hacker and when you face a maven. So, um, so if you look at the panel on the left first, so the payoff when you know you're facing a hacker is increasing in the noise. Why? Well, because if, if there's zero noise, then the hacker is very likely to find a model that will be that will be, will be validated because it is very likely that that one of these spurious correlations will look good enough 
that we will pass a 5% uh, statistical criteria. Uh, the more noise you add, the more likely it is that the hacker will find a spurious correlation that will fail to validate uh, when it is tested against the raw original data without noise. So the more noise you add, the more likely you are to catch the hacker reporting a spurious correlation. But then maybe when the opposite thing happens, you know, when you have no noise, then the, the, the maven is, you know, very likely to, or it's quite likely at least to get things right. So they, so, you know, they, they're gonna take their, their just one uh, hypothesis, there's noise, so they could get it wrong, right? But they're gonna take their, their, um, their, uh, their hypothesis, they're gonna test it, and then they're going to report something that, you know, will, uh, you know, will have some high chance of, of being correct. But the more noise you add, to the data, the more you are screwing up this legitimate use that they may be trying to uh, do uh, with, with the data. Okay, so, so this is exactly the trade-off that we are uh, focusing on in our paper. So, you know, you add noise, it's good uh, when you're facing a hacker, but it's bad when you're facing a mailer. So it's gonna be good for uh, preventing p-hacking, but it's going to be bad for the legitimate use of the data. And since you don't know who's a hacker and who's a maven, uh, so it becomes interesting to understand this trade-off. And that's that's the point of the paper. So we, you put things together, uh, you see that actually a strictly positive amount of noise is optimal. Um, and so here's a picture when, you know, there are 20% hackers and 80% mavens. So even, even though there are more mavens than hackers, it's still optimal to have a strictly positive amount of noise. And the intuition for this is what I was mentioning earlier. By definition, the maven is only trying out a small number of, um, of hypotheses. Um, and, uh, and by definition, the hacker is trying out many hypotheses. So then even a little bit of noise will not hurt the mavens uh, a lot, but it will uh, affect, the, uh, affect the hackers. Okay, so, the, so this picture is basically the message of our paper so that um, um, yeah so so this this is what creates a strictly you know uh, interior amount of noise to be the optimal um, and um, this will Federico the, a question from uh, the the other platform is uh, do we fundamentally need to have a model where the maven knows a smaller set of hypotheses yeah that is key here yes the key, the key here is that there is, you know, as the data set becomes wide, uh, the, um, the number of models that the hacker entertains, uh, you know, grows, um, you know, very quickly. I mean, here it grows exponentially, but it, um, yeah, but, but the- But you could also have the mavens uh, growing as well. It just, you probably need some bound, some like wedge between them. That that is probably true. Yes, yes. Uh, I we we haven't explored that that possibility, but but yes, but yeah. I suspect that the key thing is here is that uh, yeah, there has to be uh, uh, the, the the gap between the hypothesis that one agent and the other entertains um, grows quickly with the with the data. Uh, but we haven't uh, explored any kind of sort of quantitative uh, evaluation of this. There's a question from Colin as well. The noise is, is purely additive. The noise added by the policymaker is additive to the to the intrinsic noise. And so there's no difference. We're not regarding mavens as more sophisticated in some sense. They don't have any additional ability to partition. So if they know the policymaker's noise very uh, DGP for the noise, that doesn't that doesn't change how the two populations assess the data. It, so there's no sort of rationality. It doesn't, no. Okay. Uh, although what, what you mentioned is interesting for the following reason. Uh, in, a, in, in, in Here, I, I'm, I'm focusing on which model is right or wrong. But if you care about parameter estimates, um, about then um, the, the noise you add will create a bias in the parameter. Just think about OLS. So, so this, this is effectively a model with, uh, with measurement error. Measurement error introduced on purpose by the principle. 
So this creates biased estimates. For example, OLS estimates are going to be biased. But by releasing the data generating process from which the noise was drawn, you can in you can you can do a large sample correction for this bias. So that so this is not something we go into in, in, into to this paper, but for, for practical reasons uh, and just beyond the use of p hacking, just for this privacy reasons that I mentioned before, releasing the, the data generating process used to adding noise is important in order to be able to do this uh, correction for the bias introduced by this measurement error. Um, all right. Um, okay, Federico, this quick question maybe before we get into the model. So in a sense, this model, you have this heterogeneity uh, among researchers. So in this kind of, there are two types of researchers. Have you also played around maybe with a model where there is just one type of researcher, but it's more like, it's more like a moral hazard or some action uh, some incentive problem as opposed to a selection problem to some extent, you know, whether, or this just really the heterogeneity you think for something like this to go on? Yeah, that, that's a good question. No, the, that's it. So the, the, the literature on p-hacking in economics has, has looked at, you know, basically the interaction between uh, a researcher and, and, a, and a principal and looking at incentives or the researcher to take various actions. Uh, we have not looked at that. We have just focused on this trade-off between hacking and the legitimate. So we have these very stark uh, uh, behaviors. Um, and then our model is meant to, to, to but we, we have not looked at a, at a more sophisticated model of the actions of the agents who can either do one thing or the other and you know, see how the incentives line up here. Uh, no, in, in, in that sense, this is kind of, uh, yeah. So following on from that, I mean, it's an interesting question that whether if the P hackers are strategic and they don't want to be detected, which seems like a good assumption in practice, then I guess, you know, in the spirit of the expert testing literature, you might, you know, they might be able to come up with very sophisticated strategies for not getting caught, basically. And there's a, there's a question of what the welfare implications that might be and how that, how that, how they're affected by noise. I have no idea what the answer is, but it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, um, all right, I, before I finish my discussion of the example, let me just show you simple comparative statics that you will see in the example. And I mentioned these because we can also prove that these hold in the model. Um, so, uh, you know, if you, if you increase the amount of hackers, then you want to add more noise, uh, as you might expect. So in the upper left panel, there are 20% hackers. In the lower left panel, there are 40% hackers and the optimal amount of noise is higher. Um, if you make the data set wider, so if you go uh, in the upper right panel from 20 observations to just 10 observations, then again, you want to add more noise uh, in the optimal, uh, the optimal problem for, the, for the, the principal, which again, I hope is intuitive since we emphasize this issue uh, of the width of the, of the data set. Sorry, a clarification question. Why is this, this is very choppy. This is because you have one draw of the data. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah, this is a simulation. I, and, and actually I think Kevin has better simulations, uh, but but, but, but in order to this. answer what's optimal noise, wouldn't this be averaged out, sort of, or is it would would, would the would, would the no optimal noise be uh, sample specific for, for uh, when when the data uh, owner adds? I, it? I see, I see. Yeah, it's um, well, it's 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 sort of interim, right? So. So the so you have a data generating process for the day, for the for the underlying. Um, so think about the census. Right? So you have uh, people and their ages and the demographic characteristics. There's a data generating process for that. The census gives you a draw on this. Then the census is looking at this draw, and they are adding noise, and you're evaluating the optimal amount of noise at this interim stage, in which you have a draw of the data set, and you're considering how much noise to. Add. Got it, thanks. 
All right, so I'm gonna take this numerical example and I'm gonna simplify things uh, very dramatically in order to be able to solve the problem. Um, and uh, but I I'm gonna claim that I retain the main uh, sort of qualitative uh, aspects of the of the numerical example. So we will again have a Y data set. So there's going to be many possible explanations. This will lead to very powerful hackers who are likely to find the spurious correlation that passes statistical muster. The maven is going to consider a very small number of possible hypotheses, and the statistical standards are going to be exogenously fixed. Okay, so these are the aspects of the problem that are going to that we're going to try to keep in the in the uh, um, uh, in in the theoretical model. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly mention the literature. I think I've already hinted at this. Uh, there is a, a literature uh, in economics that looks uh, in sort of, uh, which has sort of um, uh, the theoretical models of p-hacking uh, that looks at the interaction between um, a hacker that's mining uh, data and, and, uh, and, and you know, the welfare consequences of, of this. Uh, we look at a very simplified version of this problem in which, you know, hackers can hack for free. And, uh, and we have this, you know, very stark difference between agents who hack and agents who don't hack. Um, um, but, the, but the purpose in our paper is, is different uh, from, uh, from what these uh, other um, works have, have done. We are specifically trying to evaluate the trade-off between adding noise um, that adding noise does to, to this and, and that's and, and so we try, try to find a tractable um, version of, of, of this problem um, to address it. it then there have been you know different efforts to uh, to, to address p hacking um, maybe one of the best known ones is this um, expressed in this I don't I mean, this is a really, there's a lot, you know, Et Al here is doing a lot of work. This is a paper which has, I don't know, 50 co-authors. Um, so it's, it's sort of like a, like a, like a manifest um, that proposes to lower the significance threshold from 5% 5, 5 to 0 0.05. Uh, and that is um, just to make it harder for hackers. Um, I, I'm going to argue that our proposal is complementary to this, and there's a there's a way in which you can formalize that in our in our in our model. Yeah. Um, but um, but in 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 also in in our model, basically, even though this is helpful, the hackers are going to be powerful enough that they will be able to beat any kind of uh, p value you require. Um, the other very important proposal to address p hacking is pre-registration. So uh, that has become now quite common in economics. Many journals um, expect, uh, you know, uh, people to have pre-registered their, uh, their experiments. Um, and uh, if you try to publish a paper in the AER, for example, right now, and you haven't pre-registered your study, you, will you need to explain to the editor why you didn't do it. Um, and and these, these are all very, I mean, this is this is also a very useful thing to prevent p hacking, but this is not that useful in economics because in economics, you know, most empirical work is based on pre-existing observational data, and then you know, pre-registration, you know, what it has by it for experiments when you're collecting your own data. If you're working with existing observational data, pre-registration is not going to go very far, right? It's it's going to be, it's hard to imagine that you haven't looked at the data from, you know, the PSID before, you know, when you want to read, you know, previous stage your data, when, when the, the data from the PSID has been around for, um, you know, like forever. No? Um, so, uh, so and, and, and even so, still many, many, uh, even experimental studies are not being pre registered. So it's, um, uh, so, so, so that's um, so. Basically, pre-registration doesn't, we think, solve the type of problem that we are focusing on in our in our paper. Um, there's another issue that I have, don't have in this slide, which is related to dissemination noise, 
Um, so some of the computer scientists who have proposed um, the use of um, uh, all differential privacy to address privacy, they, they have a proposal that's related to p-hacking, uh, but I'll, I'll get back to this later in, in the talk. Uh, so it, it is related to our dynamic model, but I'll, I'll get back to that a little bit later. All right, so here's the model. So there's a, uh, again, uh, there's a wide data set with many covariates. There will be a principal uh, or data steward who disseminates data. There will be a fixed decision rule, and we will call this the policymaker is going to be the one that enforces this decision rule. The policymaker doesn't do anything in our model. They just approve whatever passes the statistical criteria, okay? Um, and so there will be, there will be a data set for which you can potentially ask many different questions. And the principal doesn't a priori know which question will become relevant. So here's the model. There will be, like I said, a wide data set. What, what does a wide data set mean in our model? Well, there will be infinitely many covariates, okay? In fact, there will be one covariate for every number between zero and one, for every real number between zero and one. Okay, so a continuum of covariates. And we'll make things uh, as simple as possible. So we'll take each covariate to be binary. So each covariate takes the uh, either value, either zero or one, okay? And then there will be a, a number of outcome variables that may become relevant. Uh, so think of these as finitely many or countably. Uh, each of these is associated with a true cause Okay, A star, which is one of the covariates, and a red herring. So what's special about the red herring? Well, the, the maven will be unsure about uh, two possible causal mechanisms. One is a true one, and the other one is a red herring. Okay, the true one is going to be perfectly correlated. Okay, so in this world of binary random variables, it will be, um, that it is just identical. And the red herring will be completely wrong. So the red herring will be just one minus uh, the, the truth. So, um, so, so this is just to make things as simple, simple as possible. Like I said before, you know, a lot of these assumptions can be relaxed and we relax them in the extensions part of this. The basic idea is that all of these things the, the basic conclusion of that you need to have a strictly positive amount of noise, uh, that you want to have a strictly positive amount of noise is preserved uh, when you relax you know, most of these assumptions. At least when you relax one of them at a time. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's all in the, in the paper. And I realize I'm going slower than I thought I would, so let me go a little bit faster. Okay, so let me explain to you the data generating process. Um, the true cause and the red herring are drawn um, in IID fashion from the possible covariates. This fixes a joint distribution uh, as follows. Each of these are drawn IID equally likely to be zero and one, and that, that fixes the true causal mechanism and it fixes the, the red herring. And all the other uh, covariates are drawn uh, IID from zero one. Okay, so this describes the data generating process. And then from this data generating process, um, for the Ys and the Xs, we're gonna, we're gonna draw a finite number of observations. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, so the raw data that the principal collects is going to consist of finitely many observations from this data generating process. Okay, uh, so this is an example of a Y data set. There are N observations, uh, and then there's this continuum uh, covariance. So there are, uh, there, are N there are N observations, and there are infinitely many possible statistical models. In, in this case, the statistical models are very simple. They're, they're just about the pairwise correlation between one Y and one X. Okay, now, uh, any, you know, uh, the, the, the principal is going to release the data, you know, possibly with noise. And I will explain what the noise does in a, in a moment. And then some, you know, variable will become relevant. 
then the agent who can be either a hacker or a maven is going to analyze the disseminated data and propose a policy based on the, on the data. And finally, the policymaker who is just a mechanical agent is going to check the proposal against the raw data without noise and is going to implement it if it looks like it could be the causal mechanism. So if it is uh, identical to Y, because that's what the causal mechanism does here. And again, this is all under these simplifying assumptions that you just need to check whether the causal mechanism is exact, you know, whether the Y equals the X. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, so basically the, the main event is going to use his domain expertise it's going to be uncertain about whether it's A star or the red herring, um, and they're going to use the data to, to check. But the hacker is going to just uh, look for all the data and report the one that has the highest correlation with the, uh, with the out, out, outcome variable. Okay, so what, what, is the, what can the agent do? So the agent is either a maven or a hacker. So we say H is the fraction of hackers, and M, you know, one minus H is the fraction of mavens. Um, the, the agent cares about two things. They care about being right, and they also care about you know, getting published or being Im implemented. So, so W is the weight on being right. Uh, for the hacker, you can assume whatever you want about W, but for the maybe we will need to assume that they care enough about being, about being right. Okay, so this was uh, when, uh, what Max was asking about earlier. So you, you need the maven to care enough about, about, being, about being right. So uh, this is, uh, we think, capturing this idea of wide data set and, and fast computers uh, in the sense that we assume that there's no cost to just trying out many different uh, possible uh, specifications. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's sort of behind uh, the model of hackers that we have in, in, our, in our paper. Um, one comment to make is that here, theory and data are complements uh, because the, if you if find the probability that you know, your best guess about the true cause is right, then without either data or theory, the probability of being right is the same as if you have data, basically. Just having data will, will you know, you'll be wrong for sure. Uh, because there's so many possible models that you will get caught up in a, in a spurious correlation for sure. So, so you, just having data um, will not help you. It, you know, the theory here gives you a 50-50 chance of being right. But if you have theory and data, then you will be right for sure. So here, there is a very legitimate use of data for the, for the maven because with theory and data, they will propose a correct policy uh, for sure. Uh, I mean, this, this, I think, makes it interesting to, uh, to evaluate a trade-off because this, this means we're hurting these people who can be, you know, uh, these mavens who can be uh, correct for sure by adding, by adding noise. Okay. So what is noise here? So in, in this noise, because of we have binary random variables, the noise will, will be just about flipping the random variable. So there will be a number Q, which is the probability that you flip a covariate. Uh, and we think of the of Q as being the, the amount of noise. So Q is a noise level, right? So if you release the data without adding noise, that is the same as setting Q to be zero. So, so Q is a probability of flipping. So if you set Q to be zero, that's the same as releasing data without noise. Um, if you set Q to be you know, one half, then you know, you're equally likely to, to flip uh, random variable, that's like total noise. Uh, and then any number in between will be uh, uh, sort of the, the amount of noise that you add. Uh, and then, you know, finally, uh, the principle in our model has no way of affecting the publication norms or the statistical norms. So that's why we have this separate agent who just approves whatever passes uh, statistical criteria. So what, what are the behaviors of, uh, of these agents? So they're very simple to figure out what the optimal uh, behavior of each of these agents are. So the hacker is going to just propose a policy that is perfectly correlated with, uh, with the outcome variable. 
they're going to be wrong for sure, but they might get published, right? Uh, the Maven is going to evaluate the two alternatives, and they're going to see, you know, which of the two matches the outcome variable in more observations. Uh, okay, and then, you know, the proposal will be accepted if and only if it is a true one. In, on, in this version of the model, under the assumption that I have described, uh, when compared against the raw data, you know, the the a correct decision will be made, either to accept the proposal or to, or to reject it. Uh, but it will be the correct decision. Okay, so this sort of stack things in favor of hurting the maven quite a bit. Um, and so I think this sort of, we think leads some strength to the conclusion that you still want to add strictly positive amount of noise. So if VI of Q is a probability that uh, agent of type I's proposal is accepted when the noise level is Q, then the principal wants to maximize this uh, magnitude. So we put the H they're facing a hacker, uh, in which case they lose for sure. So that's multiplied by minus one. Uh, we put the M they're facing a maven, in which case if the proposal is accepted, it, they will um, they will they will win. Okay. So it gives a very simple objective for the uh, for the principal that, that they're trying to maximize. Uh, so this is the lemma that um, captures the idea that I was um, describing earlier. So if you if you evaluate the derivative of v prime at zero, um, the um, the der derivative for the maven is zero, but it is strictly negative for the hack. So that's exactly the result that I was talking about earlier. Um, the small amount of noise doesn't prevent the maven from finding a policy that get accepted when you start from a small amount, small number of candidates. But uh, when you're looking at a large number of, of candidate models, like the hacker is, uh, continuum, uh, there's a high chance of baits. So even, so here's a numerical uh, example. If you have Q being only 0 0.01 and you have N observations, then the probability that uh, uh, random covariate is a bait is more than 63%. But if you're just looking at uh, two specific covariates like the maven is, the probability that one of them is a bait is essentially zero. Um, okay, so that's sort of what's behind the, the basic result here. Uh, so in fact, you can derive the optimal amount of noise, uh, which is this expression. So this is a closed form of solution. Uh, to the optimal amount of noise. And you can see that it makes sense. No? So basically uh, all the comparative statics work out so that um, you know, the more hackers that there are, the more noise you want to add, um, the, you know, the, the more observations you have, so the less wide the data set is, uh, then the, least, the, the less noise you, 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 want to, you, you want to add. And it is possible to hit a boundary so even though you, you, you will never have a zero amount of noise, the one half boundary can become uh, you know, binding so that you, you, you may wanna just decide to release the data with just full noise in, in a world in which you know, that's uh, uh, dominated by, by hackers. Okay, I, I think I, I only have five minutes left. Um, so I've been slower than I thought I would. Let me, yeah, so- Sorry, I have, ask about the yeah. interpretation of that result. I mean, I guess if, if it were better in your model to just you know release pure noise than nothing at all, then I suppose that, that what we would really want to do would just be to just not follow the policy recommendations of researchers, right? Um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah that, that's, that's, a, that's a world in which, uh, yeah, basically this, this data becomes worthless. Yes, this is... Um, yeah, at least for this purpose, it might have some other use, maybe. Yes, okay. yes. Thanks. It is, it is sort of a trivial. Um, but let, let me let me just use five minutes to quickly describe dynamic model. Um, so um, yeah, so, so I mean, one one way in which you can think of our proposal is that it's kind of like out of sample testing, right? So you you reserve 
uh, some of the data. Um, in, in our case, you actually reserve all the data. Uh, and then you release another part of the data. Uh, you validate any proposal based on the, on the data that you released against the holdout, holdout data. So in our proposal, you the data you release is the data with noise and you keep all the original data as a holdout, okay? And this is goes back to this proposal made, made by researchers on differential um, um, privacy about how to access this holdout data. So, you know, you can use differential privacy techniques to give access to the holdout data in such a way that you don't learn anything from it. Or we, you, know, you learn very little from this holdout data. Um, and that's basically what we look at in our, uh, in our dynamic model. So, uh, the static version of the model imagines a situation where in the basement of the sensors, you, you keep you know, this super secret raw data without noise and you validate proposals against this noise, okay? So you might dislike the idea of this super secret data in someone's basement. Um, and you may instead want to imagine uh, that every month there's a new release of noisy data. And when you submit a paper, you know, in April, it gets evaluated against the May release of noisy data. When you submit a paper in May, it gets released, it gets checked against the June release. So you basically have these waves of noisy uh, data. And so we looked at this, we looked at this problem of, um, of a dynamic uh, data release. And the conclusion is, uh, we have some other assumptions uh, in this model, so we tweak it a, a little bit, but the basic conclusion is that um, the optimal path of noise release follows the structure where you, it is optimal to inject noise into, into the data. Um, but as time goes by, the hackers uh, become more and more powerful because they have access to all the past releases of noisy data. Uh, and then, you know, in, in the end, the, the, the noise becomes less and less effective over time. And what you do is, is that you effectively you, you give up, and you um, and you decide to um, uh, just release the data without noise. So it's it's sort of maybe analogous to a, a, a optimal um, consumption. You have a cake that you can consume over time. How much do you eat today? How much you leave to, uh, for tomorrow? Uh, and then in the end, there's a finite uh, point in time in which you uh, finish your cake. So here the cake is the amount of randomness in the system. Uh, and so basically you exhaust the amount of randomness by the multiple past releases of the data. The hackers start to uh, become more and more powerful over time. And then in the end, you decide to give up because you have um, uh, just the, the data becomes less, you know, the noise becomes less and less effective. Um, and uh, and that, that describes the optimal path of um, the dynamic release of, of data. So we, we think that this is also complementary to this differential privacy proposal in the sense that um, the reason why the hackers become so powerful in this version of the model is because they have access to this, uh, uh, all, the, all the past releases of, of noisy data and they learn from it. So if, if this can be done uh, you know, in, in such a way that they can learn less from you know, from the tests against against which the, the, the data is done against this kind of holdout hold data, then this problem can perhaps, perhaps be prevented. Um, so we, we haven't analyzed this formally, but we think that that's what this type of result uh, suggests. Um, and so, and yeah, basically, I'm, yeah, so, so we have all these extensions. We think that non-IAD observations are important. Um, uh, for example, for, for time series data, the, you know, the, the idea of having a holdout data uh, becomes impractical because you know, which data do I leave out? Do I leave out the last month's you know, uh, un unemployment uh, data that, that doesn't seem right? No? Or do I leave out, yeah. Um, so with, with time series data, the, hold, the holdout idea becomes tricky, but, but, the, but the noise, um, idea is, is relevant. So, so we have a version of our result for non-IAD observations, which is applicable to time series data. So that's like, I mean, the basic conclusion still uh, holds. Um, and we have other, yeah, we have other versions. We have, we have a version of the model, I think, which Marco had suggested with 
where there was some probability that um, Maven could be wrong. Um, so that's in that's in the paper. I don't have it in the slides, but um, but yeah, under that uh, in, in that case, there is a there's, there's something you can say about about that. Um, and uh, yeah, and and this slide has the uh, takeaway messages from the paper, which I think I've already mentioned many times. So I can just stop here. Well, thank you, thank you, Federico, for this very nice and clear talk. Okay, so now we we open questions from from the audience, no, starting from the panelists. Okay, so perhaps uh, if Marco or Peter have uh, a question, no, I mean they, they can they can address to, to Federico now. Sure, thanks a lot, Federico, for a very nice presentation. It's very interesting, and I guess uh, it's. Um... It's a very important feature of your paper that you want some practical infusion of noise here in a way in the data. That's, that's your motivation. Because one can start to think in more general ways of adding this noise. The first thing was in your binary model here with the true cause and the red herring, it's very special that you would have uh, N data draws that would be identical for the true model and for the herring. And then you could maybe say, you could add noise in a different way than this IID across N. You would just say, whenever you have an identical uh, realization string, you just mutate one of these things or, uh, or two of them, you know, you, there are more general ways to do it. And so one can wonder uh, why you choose this way. More generally, one can say, you're doing some kind of garbling of the data, which uh, apparently is worse for the p-hacker than for the uh, maven. I don't know if you have thought about this perspective and how that works in the screening or, or think of this as a kind of mechanism that you're designing to make life harder or to make it easier for the maven. I mean, I don't know if you have thought about these generalities because you also want to be specific about adding the noise. That's in a way is the question. Have you thought in these directions? So you, you're asking if we have thought about formulating this more like a mechanism design problem. I guess. Is that, is that the question? That Ultimately, yes. <laughs> Yeah, we, we thought enough about it to think that um, it was, it's very hard. <laughs> it is sort of multidimensional mechanism design and there is no, um, and there's no money. I, I don't know how to do it. Um, yeah, I, I, have, I haven't thought a lot about it, but I, um yeah it it okay but like, otherwise like, maybe like, like, yeah like, like like you said it is motivated by this very practical consideration that people are all already adding noise so the census is already adding noise to the data in this fashion and we are just yeah thinking about whether this existing practice can be uh, used also in this way to address p-hacking. Yeah, one way, one can also say by adding noise, you know, you're doing something that's easier for the Maven to handle than for the p-hacker. And that's, I guess, that's your analogy also with this differential privacy, right? Like it could be that you have some hash key that allows you to, uh, to understand this data uh, or what you have shown about the data is understandable if you know this hash key or whatever. Is, is that the idea? Is that, well, so in somehow the, in the Mavens uh, know something and, and you're using that, right? Yeah, no, the, the, the idea in the differential privacy is, is a bit different in the, so they, they, they think about this holdout data. So suppose you have, you have a data set, you release it, um, but you keep some of it uh, secret. Uh, and then any proposal is checked is validated against this holdout data. But the problem is that, you know, if, if you write enough papers, you know, each one is checked against the holdout data, you, you're going to start learning stuff about the holdout data and that allows you to p-hack, right? Um, so, so the proposal is then ta that um, to give people access to the holdout data in, in such a way that they don't learn uh, a lot from it. Um, that's uh, in, in that sense. This in in that proposal, there's no difference between the hacker and the and, and the maven. Um, and then 
but um, yeah. I, okay. Okay, but, that's it. but thanks a lot. I was just thinking in these more general ways. Maybe formulate a bit the uh, some, some some space of of actions or choices for this principle in a way. What are what is really feasible for this principle? Yeah, yeah that, that 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 is a good point. Yeah, we haven't we we have narrowed things down for the yeah. principle so that they are they so all they can do is decide on the magnitude of noise. But yeah. they could have richer uh, actions. Yeah, but you illustrate uh, very nicely the point, so that's good. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So um, maybe Marco, do you have a yes. final yeah. question? Yeah, just building on this. In a sense, you have a very nice result in proposition two, where you're looking asymptotically when the uh, n goes to infinity. Then you're showing that uh, you know when you uh, add optimally the noise. You, you reach uh, asymptotic optimality, which basically, you know. But the question I had there, you know, clearly, you know, uh, what would you do with alternative mechanisms in a way when n is small? Could, it, could there be like hold out, uh, at least one example, some examples to show and compare how hold out strategy, at least in your model, would compare to these um, added noise? Because, you know, if you think about the key difference, if I understand correctly, adding noise is more symmetric way, which I, I kind of, um, to every data with some probability, I just change it. While I hold out, I just um, with, withhold uh, asymmetrically certain, certain data, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So that's, um, th that's why we wanted to um, be able to talk about time series data in which there's no natural symmetry uh, that you can exploit in creating a holdout, um, yeah. But this is for for data where there is some natural symmetry. Uh, you, you can think of our proposal as a as an, just an alternative to a holdout. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it yeah. The, the the advantage is that this is, you know, the, the mechanism we're focusing on is the one that that is already being used for this uh, privacy reasons. So it it makes it particularly appealing um, to also um, just continue uh, the same practice, uh, but, but also use it for this uh, p-hacking uh, reasons. Thank you. Thank you. So I think there is an, uh, a question from the audience uh, from uh, Alexandros uh, Rigo. So if you want to mute yourself and, and make your sure. question. Thanks a lot. Um, I was wondering, so in, in your model in the, with the binary situation, uh, the, the data steward knows that, well, it's like a Monty Hall problem, right? So that the, the maven has 50% to get it right. The others, the, um, the hacker has 0% probability. So they can choose the optimal queue uh, and that's fine. But uh, in the real life situation, how would you choose the optimal queue? Does the, does the steward need to know the true model, right? That would be very upset. So how would, what would be the, how would you calculate the appropriate noise? I mean, my, my guess is that in practice, it is very difficult to exactly optimize this, uh, yeah. I, I think the, um, the qualitative conclusion is that a strictly positive amount of noise um, is optimal. Uh, and yeah, since, since these statistical agencies are, are already using noise for other reasons, um, this suggests that it is a good idea to also use it, um, use it in, in this way. I, I mean, the concern yeah. would be that maybe too much noise could be added, right? And then you're hurting the, yeah. the mavens. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know that it is possible that already the amount of noise that is being added for for privacy reasons is too much. Um, yeah. yeah. But uh, but yes. This is, yeah. Um, I think there is no other question. Is there? I don't have a sense of the protocol, um, whether I should ask questions here or whether go I should ahead. wait yes, until we yes. might. Go ahead. 
Okay, yes, thank you. Um, is, could you say anything about whether we would want to increase or decrease the ratio of mavens to, to p hackers? Is that a relevant right. question? If you, I mean, if you could, you for sure would want to have more mavens, yes. I guess it's easy to decrease the mavens by using other techniques. So you, um, we were talking about pre-registering research plans, for example. I mean, another technique that's used in 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 some aspects of theoretical physics is to is to obscure the rather than rather than adding noise to the data is to transform the data, so that any expertise that one brings to the problem, any priors that one brings to the problem, are wiped out because one doesn't even know what the features are anymore. So one simply knows that there are a set of features. One, one cannot read the literature to attempt to gain insight into which the relevant features are. Hmm. I think this is sometimes called triple blinding, but I'm, 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 so you do the analysis and then having done the analysis, you unseal it. Okay. Um, I, so did, that, I did not would, know about this. Okay. I think that would, that would hurt, that, that would worsen matters though, from your point of view, because that, that knocks the mavens down to zero. I, I think so. Yes, I, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think why why you would want to do this. <laughs> well, I think the idea is that it, I I, I, I've, I came across this once some years ago, so I'm I'm going to do a very bad job of representing it. But I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to cut out the researchers' imposition of priors. Um, to guide their analysis. Now that may be done already with pre-registering um, investigations. But, but that seemed, so I, I think it was being used in, in CERN style particle physics, but so if I, if I had to look for it, that's where I would start looking. I see, I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, I, 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 actually, now that you mentioned that, I have seen something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and <laughs> you could, that could be, you could think of that as adding noise, yes. Um, well, yes. it's it's it's, it's mm, yeah. It, it strikes me as as being a different way of obscuring the data because it, it does differentially bias against the mavens in this case because it breaks their expertise in a way that's different from the p hackers. No, so the mavens' expertise is what allows them to refine the the initial set of hypotheses in the first place, and it right. kills. It seems to me. Um, okay, um, is there any relation to the calibration literature? So in the in the calibration, the uh, Vora and um, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 fine yeah so so in that case again you you danger was these uninformed agents could look like they they were outperforming the experts is there is that something you've thought about? Um, I have actually dabbled in this literature at some point, um, but I never. Thought if there's any productive way of thinking about this in these terms, the models are all very different. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't think I can say anything. Uh, sure. Any um, anything useful about it? Uh, yeah. But it, it's a it's a good suggestion. Yeah. I think also Ludwig was thinking along those lines. Okay. Um, Last question, if I can. Um, so. The, the, the standard approach within machine learning is just to throw away any questions of statistical significance and do some sort of k-fold cross-validation to minimize mean squared error. Um, if you do that, rather than taking the approach that's taken here, which, which uses some standard for statistical significance, do you, how, how does that change the, the So we don't have to hold out a data set. We can, we can, let's say we trust our researchers, whether they're p-hackers or mavens, because they're going to upload their code to GitHub. And so we can run their code and we can see that they're properly implementing the k-fold cross-validation. So we can see that they're not, they're not holding out a, a special, a particular subset or, or, or that they're not cheating with their data analysis. Yeah. So I, I think of in that in our model would also be p hacking because you're you're also you you may also get caught in a causal in a in a, in a, in a pure correlation. Mm. 
So what they would, that, the standard way of doing this then is to add a regularizing term. So use a lasso model or something like that, that, that penalizes the use of additional features or regressors. Um, and so that, that would be regarded as kind of baseline good practice. I mean, I guess the, the kind of the, the slightly deeper question that I'm asking here is, so when you look at these two communities, on the one hand, the econometrics community, on the other hand, the ML community, they seem to be using very different techniques to, to perform roughly the same tasks. So on, on the one hand, our, our concern about statistical significance, on the other hand, their complete disinterest in it. Is there a way in which they're, they're, they've got it right because of the p-hacking concern, or is, is this... Is it just that they run off in a different direction? I, I, so my sense, but I can't say I have thought about this um, carefully enough. Well, I'm very pleased. Like, okay, I've, I've asked three good questions. The, but... the, the ML, no, the, the ML objective is mainly prediction. Yeah. And e econometricians are focused on identifying causal mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, and that is how we have thought about this. We have thought about the problem in terms of identifying cause a mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Most ML techniques are about predicting well. Mm -hmm. the, um, the critique here applies even if you're just looking at a prediction problem though. Is that not correct? I, I, I think so, yes, yes. But, yes, but yes. it's still, um, but I mean, you, you, can think, you can still think about this as predicting out of sample, right? Yeah. So you, so I, yeah. Coming up with the right population model is, is about you know predicting well out, out of sample, uh, but still the hacker is doing this sort of um, uh, hold, this sort of selective holdouts or multiple holdouts with existing data set. They can also, in principle, get caught in a spurious correlation uh, based on the realized data set. Uh, that may still fail, fail to validate on the, or to predict well, uh, on further out of sample observations generated from the population model. Yeah, I guess I can see that in principle. I guess it would be interesting to, to actually run the horse race. I don't, I, don't have, I don't have a sense of what the outcome of that would be, um, whether there'd be a, a zone in some ways over, over which the, the statistical significance approach perform better. I, 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 I have no intuition. So um, Colin, um, Federico, um, sorry to interrupt you, but maybe just to, to keep with the, with the schedule, okay? Maybe it's good that we stop the, the official part of the seminar at this point, and we all move to the, to the metaverse, okay? The link is available in, in the chat. You click it and you, you use the arrows to walk virtually to the, to the seminar room. We can continue the discussion there. That, would, that, would that make sense? Great. So thank you, Federico, and thank you, everybody, in particular, Marco and Peter, for joining us today. It has been a pleasure, and uh, we expect to, to see you in the virtual room to continue a more informal uh, conversation. So thank you. Thank you.